Enter Dodge designer Richard Sias. Chrysler execs notice Sias' sketches that had been made in his spare time. Amidst internal opposition, he was given permission to develop the new double diamond or Coke bottle profile. What followed was the Charger 3, a radical concept that formed the base upon what would become the second generation Charger. The new design was, as we all know, a hit. The 1968 Charger was new inside and out, but kept some throwbacks to the first gen, like the full width front grille and hideaway headlights. The roof line for 68 stepped away from the fastback design and featured a more stylish B pillar with a recessed window design. The scallops that reside on the rear quarters of the first generation were flipped around and added to the doors and hood of the second generation car. A racing inspired quick fill gas cap gave it an aggressive look along with a slight lip spoiler in the rear. The full width rear tail lights were replaced with two pairs of round tail lights. The new design shot the Charger into instant popularity in the muscle car ranks. Engine options consisted of the 225 cubic inch slant 6, the 318 V8, and 383 with the two or four barrel carburetor, backed by either a three speed automatic or three or four speed manual transmission. The introduction of the second generation Charger also brought a new option, the RT. Standing for road track, the RT Charger came standard with a 440 big block and the 426 Hemi as an option. On the outside, there weren't many signs except for some RT emblems and the bumblebee stripe on the hind quarters. The stripe could be deleted at no extra cost. The second generation Charger became the iconic Coke bottle design that classic muscle car enthusiasts all know and love, and it has even had an influence on the latest generation of Charger today. Not to mention classic movies like Bullet, Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, the Fast and Furious franchise, as well as the Dukes of Hazard, have kept the car in the limelight for decades. The world of racing was another story. On the street, the Charger was a winner. On the track, it was struggling. It was extremely difficult to handle, and traction was a huge problem. Their biggest competitor was Ford and Mercury, and they unleashed a pair of aero warriors on the super speedways in the form of the Torino Talladega and the Mercury Cyclone. These two threats caused Dodge to do something that was revolutionary. They rented a wind tunnel to find the solution. More on that later. For 1969, the Charger received a minor facelift. Some of the more obvious changes were, the front grille was redesigned with the divider down the middle. The rear taillights were elongated for a more aggressive look, and the side markers were changed from round to rectangular lights. A special edition package was added alongside the RT, and the RT Bumblebee stripe was changed from a double stripe to a thicker single stripe with the RT logo etched in the side. The stripe could be deleted, and if so, then an RT emblem was placed where it would have been on the stripe. The powertrain remained virtually the same. Now, back to the wind tunnel. During their research, they realized that the Charger looked fast, but in NASCAR, air management is key, and it was determined the Charger didn't manage the air very well. It wasn't horrible at it, there were just a couple of issues. The first being the recessed front grille. At high speeds, it created turbulence, hindering its ability to split the air. The second issue was the rear window. While the flying buttress look was attractive, it made a low pressure area at the base of the glass, creating lift. Now we all know how bad turbulence and lift can be on the track, so the engineers at Dodge went to work to address the issue. And here's what they came up with for 1969. The Charger 500. When it comes to air management, the Charger 500 was a vast improvement. Here's what they did. For starters, they addressed the recessed grill area by fitting a coronet grill flush to the opening. Next, they used a fiberglass plug to fill in the cavity in the rear and mounted a new rear window flush to the roof line. Finally, the A-pillars were streamlined with the addition of stainless steel covers. The end results ended up with a charger that was much more stable and 6 miles an hour faster. However, it still wasn't enough to keep up with Ford and Mercury. Dodge had to pull out all the stops. It was back to the wind tunnel, and what they came up with was pretty radical. The Charger Daytona. The look of the car is, well, polarizing. You don't kinda like a body like this. You either love it or hate it. The Dodge execs weren't concerned about the radical looks. They wanted to win on the track, so it was function over form with the Daytona. 
just about every racing sanctioning body had the rule that if a manufacturer wanted to race a vehicle in a particular form, they just made a version of it available to the public, usually 500 units. This is called homologation. So, for some, the racing version of the Charger Daytona looked menacing, while the street version looked like overkill, or vice versa. They began with the Charger 500 and everything it is. The leading edge of the fenders were modified to accept a 23-inch aluminum nose cone complete with hideaway headlights. The front fenders also received a pair of reverse style scoops that were rumored to be there for wheel clearance, but they were more likely air extractors. The A-pillar covers were retained as well as the flush mounted rear glass, and the Daytona was finished off with a 23-inch tall wing in the rear and a race-only 426 Hemi under the hood. Street versions look similar, except that while street versions were merely street chargers with the Daytona pieces attached. Most of the race cars were purpose-built, making the body lines look more fluid. Engine choices for the 500 as well as the Daytona start off with the 440 Magnum with the optional 426 Hemi. And backed by the mighty 426 Hemi, the Charger Daytona was a definite performer on the track. It was the first to officially break the 200 mile an hour barrier and won a total of six races. Not only that, they set numerous speed records. It was clear that these Aero Warriors were going to completely change the face of NASCAR racing, possibly pushing the speeds far beyond the capabilities of the drivers and definitely past tire technology. For the 1971 season, NASCAR execs ruled that no Aero car could compete with an engine larger than 305 cubic inches, pretty much ruling the car out of competition. For 1970, the Charger received yet another facelift. The splitter in the front grille was removed and the entire front end was given a wraparound bumper. In the rear, the tail lights were slightly enhanced to give it the look of being a full width light. Trim levels of base, SE, and RT remain the same. The look for the RT was also mostly the same with the addition of pseudo air extractors that cover the scallops on the doors emblazoned with the RT emblem. The engine options remain the same with the addition of the 446 pack. The Charger 500 also carried over from 69, but was in trim only. With the Daytona, there was no need to develop a 1970 Charger into a race car. As good as the last mile of the second generation looked, it was quickly losing sales to the newly introduced pony car, the Dodge Challenger. On the racetrack, the Charger garnered 10 wins, which allowed Bobby Isaacs to capture the Grand National Championship. So, not a bad exit for the last year of the model run.